I'm Steve Caldicott. Uh, I'm presenting today uh, on behalf of the Association of Physical Education. Uh, I, have a, I have a wide range of roles. One of them is the AFPI, AFPI Health and Safety Lead. So if you are a, a member of, of AFPI, it's me, you get to speak to on the phone or email with inquiries. I'm also leading the secondary Sport England project for them on behalf of AFPI. Uh, and I have a range of other areas that I, I lead in uh, for my own business. But one of those key ones is uh, that I'm a current serving Ofsted inspector. So feel free to leave now if you want to do. Um, but that I use that knowledge to help in the uh, curriculum development around physical education. So I think, you know, that, that's me. And hopefully um, you'll see how what I can bring to the table helps you in your thinking. Nice snappy title I've got. The thinking behind the EIF, which is the Education Inspection Framework. It's not an Ofsted framework, it's an Education Inspection Framework. Curriculum considerations for PE planning primary or secondary, you'll see it makes no difference whatsoever which phase you're in, and unpicking the deep dive at primary and secondary level, which will be the same as well. So that will be a key message that whichever phase you are in, the education inspection framework was written with, with both audiences in mind. So there's no distinction between the two. So I'm glad that we've got put both people in the room because the same messages uh, are apparent. So, <clears throat> Firstly, I cannot, I was just saying before to James, I can't wait to get back to um, when we can do things in a face-to-face -face and we talk about issues. I do feel, feel like sometimes I'm at this, uh, this seance because I'm literally now talking to my computer and behind me is a, a greeny wall in my office and I'm if, if, if they'd probably locked me away if they could see me just talking to a wall into a computer. So uh, one day, very soon, we'll get to meet and meet again. And I know I have met some of you in the past. So I'm going to start with my key message, which is a summary at the start. So please don't read that and then leave. This is what I've got to. And then I want to explain how we get there. It is certainly a time of hope, particularly COVID. It's definitely a time of opportunity. It was before COVID. It is now. And I almost want to turn these next things into a, like a strap line of my key message. What I'd love to say to people is that you do not fear Ofsted. I can almost put this into one sentence. Do not try to please Ofsted. Do please your children. And then Ofsted will be pleased. So if that makes some form of sense to you, I hope it does, is that we're not doing this for Ofsted. If you do things for the right reasons, you will be pleasing Ofsted without doing it for them. So there's no way to, reason to fear um the inspection framework and it is very very important you'll see afterwards that if you want to shine in inspection you need to develop a high quality physical education curriculum and it's the curriculum that we'll be focusing on now and now more than ever the curriculum is what is being looked at when you get an inspection and i do genuinely honestly believe how you know i've been inspecting for over 20 years um, because I, I do this on a, on a part-time basis, that this education inspection framework helps you to move forward. And I honestly believe that hands, hands on heart, this is the best framework we've had. We have this very new real post COVID-19 challenge. And I'm trying to think of everything in terms of next stage forward that we're doing this without thinking about COVID. So I'm not doing a COVID, this COVID curriculum. So what we do have though, as a result of what's gone on over last year, and particularly in primary, we've really got to ensure that PE has a key place on the curriculum. And I do know some of the secondaries have been withdrawing from the secondary teacher training programme, which is very disappointing when we've never needed more PE more than ever. But the key point is ensuring that when we say physical education is on the curriculum, that's what we mean, because there's been a little bit of a danger that it may be something else is physical education when it's not, which is that. And I'll go right out there and say that straight away, that Joe Wicks is not the nation's PE teacher, despite what anybody says, what the media says. He is not the nation's PE teacher. He did a great job in keeping people physically active, students and, you know, sometimes teachers doing the same thing every day. A great job doing getting people active, but he's certainly not educating through the physical, which is what we are doing. You'll see more of that in a moment. And I just thought I'd throw that in as well. Neither is Bez, because I do believe and I've seen that Bez through his version of 
I don't know what it was called, PE, physical activity, whatever it may be. So, but we do have, we're not, in all seriousness, we've got to contend with this because that, that's the sort of things that's been out there in the media. And um, we've now got to fight that and, and gather ourselves and get back to what physical education is. And this poster, I've, I'm, I've presented to you before, I've showed this before to you. It's an excellent working document to help you to remind yourself to re-engage your staff, re-engage students, and particularly your senior leaders who may have been convinced that Joel Wicks is the answer. Joel Wicks is on the right-hand side of this diagram. He's the physical activity, you know, and there's nothing wrong with doing things like the Daily Mile, for example. They're fantastic, but they have physical activity. And you've got school sport, that's the additionality. That tends to happen three o'clock onwards, sometimes in lunch times or over weekends. That's the additionality. But the part on the left, the physical education, is what we need to get back to. And it's what we certainly need to be promoting and pushing as, as our way forward. And without going through each of the definitions, just look at the, on the left hand side, the two key parts that are in the inverted commas. It's about learning to move. So we're getting people more physically competent and moving to learn learning through movement, a range of skills and understandings beyond physical activity, such as cooperating with others. So what we're saying is the, the, the activity you teach and what you do is the vehicle at that point. So in effect, you're not teaching dance and you're not teaching gymnastics. It's actually gymnastic activity through which we learn to be physically educated. And that's just a change in activity. So as the activity changes, it shouldn't matter because you are still physically educating your students. Very, very important. This is, this is picking up, a, you know, it's a post-COVID message, but it's always been there. But at this moment in time, very, very important that PE should be on the curriculum. So it's a broad and balanced curriculum is essential. And you'll see that in the Ofsted framework, which the education inspection framework we talk about at the moment. A broad and balanced curriculum is essential both within the school curriculum, so PE should have some time on the curriculum and within the PE curriculum itself. And I'll challenge you at some point to ask yourself which activities you do. Have you looked at the range of activities and is it over games dom dominated? Uh, sometimes it is when you actually unpick your curriculum, it's 80% games. Is that what it should be? Where's the aesthetic and creative elements? and so on and physical education is an entitlement and i've given you something from 1978 written by unesco to show you how long we've been talking about pe as being an entitlement um every human being has a fundamental right of access to pe and sport which are essential for the full development of his personality look at the word there that's how old this is that you would not get away with that word his now uh, but it just shows you it was very probably a very male dominated um, perspective at that time. But that message without the word his still stays. It's a fundamental right of access. And if you're trying to think of and you can link this is linking it to the education inspection framework. What how what you're trying to develop with your children. Here's another poster from AFPI. They're available from the website of how physical education contributes. And that's a very useful poster if you are, you're, you're struggling with your SLT or your governors to ensure PE is on the timetable. Because we do know that some have thought, well, we need to catch up on the, the core curriculum and it's the English and maths becomes important. Well, there's two parts to that. Do we need to catch up anyway? Do we, why make the assumption they're behind? They may be behind. We've not asked the question if they are. And if they're catching up on anything, Perhaps something like physical education is what we have to catch up on because they've had a year stuck in their bedrooms um, doing their theoretical work and academic work in the bedroom. And for some of you may have, uh, for those students who were home based, um, you may have actually accessed things like the Oak Academy PE work, which was very useful at the, at the time and certainly helped. But we must also say as well that, that for some teachers and some schools, they were in, they were in school from day one. They didn't actually finish. So you've got some students who were homeschooled and some who were not. So another useful poster, I hope, that will help you to convince any um, reluctant SLT or others. Let's look then at the, uh, the concept of the deep dive and build backwards from this. And again, I'm only doing this because it's what people 
concern about and worry about, and they shouldn't be. And you'll see that if you ever have a deep dive in your subject, it is not a subject inspection. The whole point of a deep dive, as you'll see in a moment, is to uh, exem as, is to exemplify and see what system systemic issues are in schools. And I'll explain more about the moment. So it's definitely not a PE inspection. And this key message is that the curriculum is key to everything that goes on if you are visited by an inspector. And that's been around for a while now, probably been using that slide for two years. That's not changed. The, I'm going to show you a few key wording changes to the updated handbooks afterwards, but that has not changed. And if you look at the, the left-hand side of this, the quality of education, it's probably a bigger box, I like to think, because that is what the focus of any education inspection framework visit is about. Quality of education. The other two bo three boxes, behavior and attitudes, personal development, leadership and management, they are the evidence around that is picked up largely initially through the lesson visits and the lesson conversations when they're looking at the quality of education. <clears throat> and everything around that quality of education is around the curriculum. And we'll explore that in a moment. So that box on the left, if somebody did visit you, the first point of entry in the questions will all be around your quality of education. And that's what I'm going to focus on now and I will touch upon a little bit on personal development later, uh, but it's the quality of education. And just to say, intent, implementation and impact are Ofsted words. You do not have to use them in your planning if you do not want to. If it works for you, great, but don't let the tail wag the dog. So if it confuses you, don't use the words. You don't, there's no expectation you have an intent statement, an implementation statement, an impact statement. They are effectively a research journey, if you think about it that way. Intent is the, where do I want to get to? You know, that's how the curriculum planning is. The implementation is how am I going to get there? So how am I going to structure it? And the impact is how do I know I've got there? So if you think about that as a journey, that's all it is. But do not let those intent, implementation, impact words uh, affect you if you don't want to use them in that way um, importantly I mean I've, I've, I've heard of some schools where they've appointed a head of intent a head of implementation a head of impact which seem, to me seems to make no sense I can't see how that would work because they're all co-joined and they all inform each other uh, and importantly from this what you'll see is particularly for our secondary colleagues is that under impact, attainment and progress includes national tests and assessments. It isn't everything. So it is perfectly possible for somebody with what you may call lower results down the road to have a better inspection outcome than yourself if when you consider the whole range of things in there. So it impact is not just examination results or in primary, in SATs. And so it's about the core PE and we do not have SATs in there as well. So a lot of this is about what do you, how do you want your students to get better? What does a, a physically educated child look like? And there, there's some of those decisions come down to what you believe as well. So I thought I'd throw that up again, but just to remind you, the curriculum you'll see here is the most important thing. So if you get a, a deep dive, this is what happens. And this is where your role would fit in, why it's important to talk about it, is that on day one, now whichever inspection that you get, whether or not it's a section five or a section eight, and a section five is for the, for the, the, the typical uh, inspection if you're, well, in, in a range of categories, but there's probably as many section eights now happening because the section five is what we call the standard inspection. The section eight are for those in a range of circumstances and a range of contexts. So, and we can now inspect outstanding schools as well who are no longer exempt. We can, uh, a section eight would apply to a good school and a section eight would apply to those who are in special measures, serious weaknesses, who are getting monitoring visits. So whichever one you're getting, this is likely to be the similar process, even though the methodology is slightly different and some of the questions are slightly different in there, that there will always be that conversation before the day before with the, with the senior leader, usually the head teacher, with the, 
around a 90 minute conversation, but it will tend to be longer now because of COVID over one or two calls. Uh, and then the, with a the senior leader, they would agree what the focus is going to be for the start of the inspection. So that's in the, the first top level conversation, number one. And then you would get to number two, discuss the curriculum content and sequences within the subject. And that would usually mean on day one of an inspection, whichever type it is, you we would be meeting with the curriculum leaders from the subjects that have been chosen for a deep dive. And some of those subjects are chosen because of their performances around examination data and other assessment information. Uh, and some are chosen because the school might put them forward to say, look, we're very happy. We think this is where we've really got this right. So you could get chosen for that reason. Um, and what would happen then would be a, a significant discussion would be around your curriculum intent. So it's fair to say now that if you do get a deep dive, secondary or primary, the subject leader, the curriculum leader would be the one holding this conversation. And then what happens in any, any order whatsoever, these can happen now, you get lesson visits, not observations, because there's no grading. We're not looking at the teaching per se. You'll get work scrutiny, wouldn't happen in PE unless you are looking at GCSEs and BTECs in the secondary context. Um, then we'd have the conversations with pupils and conversations with teachers, and typically it will be the same teachers and pupils that we've seen in the lesson visits. And what we're trying to do then is to see if all their experiences match up and what's being said by the curriculum leader and by the school is being reflected in what the experiences are for, for teachers and for students. You connect all those things together and we come back to see if that matches up to the big picture of the, of the school. So that's a rather simplistic way of doing it, but just to say that what is important is that your school needs to start to understand your curriculum uh, and also, you need to understand, really get a, a clear understanding of why you are doing what you are doing, which is why in some uh, cases, schools have gone back to start again, just to think, what is it we're trying to do here? Um, and then importantly, if you run in a, a department, secondary or primary, do all your other teachers understand this? And have you articulated this and shared it with um, pupils and senior leaders, for example? So that's that process. So what, what effectively from take from this is that you will have a conversation with an inspector. That's number two there, the yellow box, if you are a curriculum leader. And if you're having any, um, when you do have a deep dive, these are four questions that would appear in all of the deep dives. Not necessarily in this way. There'll be sub questions that sit beneath this, but the big picture questions, this is what the inspector is trying to find out. Now, that may include the conversations with you, but it would also include the range of evidence collecting later on when we look at lessons, pupils, and so on. Do they all match up? So firstly, and this is very, very important, how well does the curriculum meet the coverage requirements of the national curriculum? And that's, that's quite new. I've been inspecting for a long time, and I've never, um, I've never heard so much reference to the national curriculum, which is good. It's important. Now, even if you are an academy and a freed school, uh, we often hear that, well, we've got curriculum flexibility. You have, but what you have to do is to show how whatever curriculum you're designing meets at least the expectations of the national curriculum. So in reality, the national curriculum is a reference point for every school who are publicly funded. So how well does it meet the, the coverage requirements of the national curriculum? And I think it's important here to say, and ask yourself the question, how well do we use it? When you look at the PE section of the national curriculum for your phase, it's two, two and a half pages, something like that. And it often gets ignored. So because it's so of so, so few words, there's probably a real need to go and unpick those words and really look at it and go back and say, what does this mean? And really thinking about the curriculum, it's a set of ingredients that being included in the school curriculum. So these are essential ingredients that should be in there. And the, the messages on the right there are almost giving you that little tip to say that it's not everything, but it's like baking a cake. There are some things that are essential to baking that cake and that national curriculum could be in that cake. And then you should be considering what other things are needed to make this cake perfect. Apologies for any reference to uh, food there, but 
Um, that's how to think about it. So it needs to be in there, but it, but the national curriculum is not your curriculum. It just needs to be part of your planning. The second question is, how coherent is the curriculum, that thread running through it? Okay, so what is it? What's the essential knowledge and, and skills you're trying to develop as you go through that curriculum? And that will be unpicked. And that's a good question to start asking yourself. And that's why honesty is required if you want to actually ask yourself if the curriculum is really of high quality. Now that's key. And it just links to something I would say later is, <clears throat> excuse me, just by not, ch not changing activity is not a development of a curriculum. So just because we say we do games here, then we do gymnastic activity here, that's, that's not a coherent curriculum. That's just changing the activity. What's the essential thread running through regardless of which activity you're teaching? And some of the clues are in that national curriculum. And how is it sequenced? So what's the order in which students learn new knowledge and skills? Now, let's really think it's not just about the skills themselves. If you think of, if you actually look at that curriculum, you may have heard of heads, hearts and hands as one metaphor to be using for that. It's not just, oh, it's about skills. It's about thinking skills as well. And it's about leadership skills and it's a whole range of things. So let's try to move away from uh, week one, we do left foot week two we do right foot and so on that's what not we mean but if you want to ask yourself a challenging question um what's the difference between a year three curriculum and your year six and what's the difference between let's take it extreme your year seven and your year 11 how do they move on and what's the difference what's the sequence looking at what's the expectation that they should be getting to a reminder for secondary colleagues as well is that key stage four real needs real consideration because we're still working through and the GCSE and the BTEC are additional and every child is entitled to a national curriculum so let's just not throw that one away and think it's there's nothing happening in there uh, there should be a link between key stage three and four and very, very important one. And this is typically the sort of questions that you may get. And I know certainly I've asked these types of questions before. How does what pupils are learning link to the past? I.e., why are you doing this today? And it should be linking to your curriculum map. And how does it link to future learning? So what next for you? So where are you in this? Now, importantly, if you've got a curriculum overview and you're saying very thematic, that um, at this moment we're going to, when we walk into this lesson, you don't need to know micro objectives, but you know, we're going to go into this lesson now and we're doing gymnastic activity. Uh, and the, the big focus this term is around developing leadership skills and helping students to analyze and evaluate each other's movement, for example, because we've got a range of iPads and we get them to use, to use that to all those conversations, great. And then if you open the door, and what you see is somebody just bowling underarm in a quick cricket session, you've got questions to answer. So it's about knowing what's going on and what should be happening typically. And you'd be expecting, if it's two different groups and, and differing around ability, you'd be expecting them doing the same work, not doing what you might call a special needs lesson. You'll be doing the same things, but on the same type of approach, but maybe adjusting your pedagogy so everybody can access that same curriculum. And we've put on um, the website, the Appy website, we developed this about last year. So here's some questions to start you off and they build on the question, the four questions I've just given you there. Um, and if you really want to be honest and ask yourself good key, key questions, go through these and honest, answer them honestly. And you can't just do it as a yes or no. They probably need a debate with your team. So just going right down to point, is it six there? In, is it inclusive as an example? Let's have a discussion and a debate around that. How do you know? Have you got pupil voice on this? So there's a whole range of questions and this is quite a useful starting point for asking yourself honestly, um, if you're at where you're at and don't be afraid to change something that's been there for years. Why is, why is this there? Because it's always been there. Well, that may be okay, but ask yourself the question is, should it be there? Should it be different? And if you come up with the answer that it's okay there, you've asked the question. And a, qu a quite important one, uh, just below that, is are you narrowing the curriculum for SATs or GCSEs? Often, we, you'll know as colleagues that um, 
that PE can be the forgotten partner sometimes and we get things pulled off because uh, we, we now run it for GCSE and we lose the core curriculum for secondaries or you lose time for SATs or particularly to say we're doing no PE now for six weeks because we're practicing our SATs and so on. Well, that's not what it should be about. It should be a wide curriculum. And if you've got a key stage uh, in secondaries, if you've got a key stage three that's run over two years and not three, then questions will be asked about that. And you should be able to say that we cover all the essential knowledge in a two year period over three and we're happy with that. But you will get asked about that if you've got a reduced key stage three curriculum, but there's nowhere does it say that you cannot have a two year uh, key stage three curriculum. So that's just said to say, it will be questioned and asked about, and you need to justify and say why you got to the position you've got to. And there's a few, um, if in terms of the education inspection framework updates, uh, as of May, there was a, uh, they were released and we've got two, some new messages here, uh, particularly related first off to COVID. So it's inspectors will look at how subject leaders and teachers have identified learning gaps and starting points, but don't assume that everybody has a learning gap. So it may be there isn't one. But if there is a learning gap, what is it? It might not just be skill. It might be social aspects, for example. And, and some of the early findings found that some of the learning gaps were based around fitness in the sense that not measuring it, that some students couldn't quite keep up with what they used to be able to do before lockdown. Or there may be learning gaps from PE around the socialization the inability to work in groups anymore and to, you know, having not spoken to their colleague, their peers for a long time. So that might be the type of gaps that you look for in physical education, but let's not assume that they're there because they may not be, just ask that question. And it's just to say that a school can be inspected out of sync because if you're an outstanding school or a good school, without going into detail, you'll be inspected over a period of time. And so typically it might say it'd be five years until you get inspected and so on. And that's the case. However, if there are ever heard about any concerns about the breadth and balance of the curriculum, so you could throw in there and to say that we're not doing PE at the moment. And I know some schools have said that we're not doing a PE, we're called concentrate on English and maths. If there are concerns expressed, that is one of the reasons it's in the handbook on page 13 to say that a school could be inspected out of sync because we've got some concerns around it. So that just shows you the importance of keeping a well-balanced curriculum. And very, very important is Ofsted will, they're all from the handbook, as you can see, will judge fairly schools that take radically different approaches to the curriculum. If you want to be brave and you've got an exciting new curriculum, that's why I say this is about um, opportunity and hope just if it's thought through, that's fine. There isn't a set curriculum. There is not one. And, you know, indeed, some schools are coming up with really exciting curricula for, for their students. Inspectors will assess any school curriculum favourably when leaders have built or adopted a curriculum with appropriate coverage content structure and sequenced it and implemented it effectively. So what we're saying here is if you've got a great idea, that's the intent side of it, but your idea has to come to reality Intent isn't what you are going to do. The intent is re in reality is what is actually happening in your implementation. You need to have moved it forward. So that should inspire you with confidence to say that if you celebrate a diverse curriculum that embeds the national curriculum but goes beyond it, that's going to be looked upon favorably if, it, if it's working. OK, if it's working. So do not be afraid to do that. Because um, I often get asked in this question, can we use a, a curriculum from the public domain? And, and it is worth saying that there is no standard curriculum, as I've alluded to before. There is no off the shelf curriculum. So be very, be very, very cautious if you just say, here's a five year curriculum. Just teach this. Well, if you do that and try and teach somebody else's curriculum, it doesn't always work for you and it doesn't always meet your needs. So. I think the best thing is sometimes is, is if you can take ideas from others and take lesson schemes and units and use the ideas to come up with your own version of your curriculum, because then you know you own it. Because each curriculum is bespoke and should have been developed by asking yourself key challenging questions. And that's why, as I said before, schools five miles apart can be very different in their curriculum, but both be doing a good job. And it is certainly exciting. So I think this would be given this, if you like, permission to develop an exciting curriculum. 
just to get rid of a few myths, again, these are from the new handbook that have come in. It does not require curriculum plan in any format, so we don't need to be seeing schemes, units, lessons, wherever it may be. One of the things that has been really useful uh, at the moment, and I allude to it later on, is been, some schools have been able to develop some, some of the, you've probably seen them for other subjects, like the SNAPE diagrams that really present your curriculum. And if you can do that for physical education, that's fantastic. But that SNAPE diagram shouldn't be in year seven, we're doing athletics, we're doing games and so on. It's about the learning. So if you do a for a version of that, and I'd love to see anybody's uh, seen what people are producing. If you are doing a version of that, make sure you're drawing up key learning at the at that particular point in time, what your focus is for year seven or what your focus is for year four. And that can help. And if you can, it can certainly help you to get your SLT to understand your curriculum. And I'll, I'll touch upon that with some more questions I've got later. And it does not, Ofsted does not specify how planning <clears throat> should be set out, the length of time it should take or the detail it should contain. And there is no reference to the amount of time any subject should have on the curriculum. It just doesn't appear because that, would, that wouldn't come from Ofsted, that would come from DFE and it doesn't, you know. So that's why sometimes we do struggle to keep PE on it. But obviously me being a biased practitioner would want more PE wherever possible. So the, and they, they will focus on, this is where we look to personal development at the moment, we'll focus on understanding the steps taken to offer a wide range of personal development opportunities at the school open to all pupils in March 21. Obviously understanding that some pupils have been there uh, con continuously. And the reason it's worth drawing that up because we're going to look at personal development moment is just to say that the offer is the most important thing. When we're looking at personal development, it's very difficult to judge the impact of personal development and some of the things around in that personal development statement and the criteria won't be known until stu students have left school. But physical education has a major part to play in the offer to develop personal development. And here it is. That's, that I've just take, there's the criteria from personal development. I've taken just three areas and there's a lot more to it and drawn out that what you should be doing is offering things that develop these areas spiritual moral social and cultural development huge physical education plays a fantastic part in in doing that and if you it, you know if we were to do a workshop on this and i got you to come up with ideas you'd certainly come up with ideas a massive range of ideas um and then we've got there's no other subject comes up with SMSC better than us and developing character. And of course, the last part there is about maintaining an active lifestyle. We play a huge part in that. But don't forget that judgment is about the whole school, not about physical education. What I'm doing there is showing you the significant part that's played. And, and in, in 2011, I published a book with Andy Fratwell. Many of you know, may know he's from uh, your neck of the woods. He deals with a lot of assessment ideas. Uh, called In Deep Learning to Learn, where it's, a, well, we, we, we're biased, but it's, it had a good, very good forward, where it helps you to show how you can develop creativity, curiosity, resilience, learning relationships. Now that book now, because it's 10 years old, the messages are still the same, some excellent ideas in there. It's now out of print, but if anybody wants to get access to that, I'll put my email on there, I can, I can get you an access to an e-copy. But um, it's certainly some of the ideas in there have come from teachers and I still think it's a, a great resource because it shows how you're contributing to personal development. So feel free to make contact should, uh, should you want to pick up on that. Cultural capitals mentioned as well in the, I'm sure you've heard and done a lot of work around that. There's a little bit of a, like a working definition and we got to see how physical education can contribute to that. And we can be talking about the, you know, the appreciation of human creativity and achievement and, and using role models and some of the excellent examples about people from Olympics and Paralympics. And, you know, you'll have far more ideas than I would on that, but we can make a significant contribution to cultural capital. So I'd encourage you to do that. And importantly now, in terms of what Ofsted looking for, which I think is makes sense really all around, is that the curriculum is working. If your pupils are making progress in the sense of knowing more, remembering more, and being able to do more. But it's that knowing, it's a knowledge-based curriculum, where, but effectively to do that, they need to remember more so they can use it in their next stage. 
And so we're talking about getting things into long term memory. So do not be afraid to continuously practice and revisit activities. It doesn't always need to be new learning. It may take you six weeks to get through something. So don't be worried that you need a micro objective for every day. It may be some of your objectives that you're working for is going to take you a few weeks to work on. And literally in your physical education lesson, the bell has got in the way because you were into a good flow. So pick up your next lesson and say, where were we before the bell went? Don't feel the need to have a starter, a, a main theme, a plenary and so on if it doesn't work for you. So you almost got that permission to say, it's just a, it's a, an, a teaching episode that was interrupted by the bell. And if you, you do get visited, again, it's the wording from the handbook, if you do get visited in a lesson, it's looking at how that lesson contributes to the school's intention. So what we're effectively saying is it should be, you should be teaching what's expressed in your curriculum outline because of effectively what we're looking at is how well is the curriculum implemented? And you can see intent and implementation there are, are the words that are used, but if you don't want to use those, it doesn't, it's, it does, it's not an issue whatsoever. So the impact, impact the implications, sorry, for curriculum planning um, are, the, I use the analogy from uh, Jack Reacher. Um, and I, I do believe that the lead child is from the Birmingham area. so. Uh, some of you may be familiar with his work. Um, I've read all his books, think they're fantastic. Uh, my elephant in the room is that Tom Cruise shouldn't be playing him because he's about my size and Jack Reach is six foot five. There's a, a different story. But the message around using that is our curriculum is about hoping for the best and preparing for the worst. So what we're trying to do, these key messages on the left-hand side here, is avoid a COVID curriculum. So plan your ideal and avoid a COVID curriculum becoming the norm. And that's what with the danger is because the COVID curriculum may have involved, certainly in primary, some of the Joel Wicks work. So to me, it's about planning your ideal and just adapting it for COVID at the moment, but knowing that as the, as the shackles come off, we can go back to the, not, the, the sense of normality and we don't end up post COVID with a new COVID curriculum. So that's me. And I think it's just, I, I did, when I was about 2008, when I was working for AFPI, the last secondary curriculum review, I've always been remembered that how Walt Disney became so successful. And this is how I think we should think as curriculum planners, is that the reason he was so successful, Walt Disney, he was, he was a real visionary and he wanted to try new ideas out. So he came up, he came up with three stages in terms of, so if you like product development and film development, his first phase was the dreamer, and he would actually sometimes take people into different rooms to do this, to remind them where they were. And it might be something you could consider in your school, take them into different rooms, because the dreamer was about the, the fantasizing and the creating the most fantastic and sometimes absurd ideas. Uh, and there was no filter there, and it was almost a question of just getting wonderful, raw ideas out there and saying, why not? And that's having this visionary intent, really. And then what he'd do is the realist, the, dr the dreamer would then be re-examined and reworked into something a little bit more practical. So that first dream idea would be then narrowed down to say, we've got something a bit more practical there. And, and it was simply about how you could go about achieving that dream. So you've worked this down into a more realistic model. And then the spoiler was becoming the critic shooting holes in the ideas that you've come up with. And that means anything that survives this can be done. But to me, if you don't dream first off, we can't actually put the spoiler in. And sometimes because of school pressures, we become the critic before we've dreamed. And I think that's probably something we need to try to stop doing. And bearing in mind what the Ofsted was saying before, if you've got a, a, an out there curriculum and it's working, more power to you. So I, if you, I encourage you to read up on that Walt Disney story. It's a fantastic piece because it does show you how you can sometimes get there. So in terms of the intent, so remember the words are for Ofsted, but the intent wording from the good criteria, because 
if you wanted to get an outstanding judgment, it's, it's good plus the other criteria. But I've just taken some uh, key words to show you the importance here. That an ambitious curriculum is absolutely vital. It's been there for some time and it's designed for all pupils, but you must particularly look at SEND students and see what the offer is for them. As we said before, in a sequence curriculum, it's actually in the criteria. Is it sequence and is it not narrowed? So if you were to look at the handbook, there's a whole range of things in the criteria. I've just taken the words out and shortened them into a very brief, usable statement, I would suggest. Implementation, some of the key words here. Subject knowledge, it's very, very important that the staff running what you're doing have good subject knowledge. That didn't appear in the previous frameworks. And a lot of CPD and professional learning over recent years for teachers has been very much about behavior management uh, and a whole range of other issues, you know, whole school wide issues, which are great, but we seem to somewhere on the line have lost the subject knowledge element to it. So it's how can you train up your PE teachers and those teaching PE to get better at the subject. And that would apply to other subjects, all of the subjects across the school, because this, this is a, it's written for across the school. And it's this notion of learning the curriculum. How have you set it up so they can learn the curriculum in terms of the essential knowledge we talked about before? And nicely this time around, which I may have mentioned before, we've got us using assessment well and the burden on staff. If you got whichever inspection uh, you took or section five, section eight, that would be considered that the workload is not too much for teachers. And if you're doing what's called data drops or, or equivalents, um, and you're doing more than a couple per year, questions will be asked about it, not to pick it up, just to say, how is that working? Is it too much for staff? Does it actually do what it says? Uh, and what's the point of it? So we can now ask questions around assessment. And just a little reminder to ease your workload, there is no point producing 4,000 pages of spreadsheets with red, amber and green on it, and showing the inspector about how each pupil's moved on and so on. We, we as inspectors will only look at a published uh, assessment information and examination data and not only will we, we are not allowed to look at any internal data so if you show us these huge sheets we say sorry i don't want to look at them i can't look at them i'm not allowed to look at them what you can say is how our assessment processes are working and this is how we know if people move on and how people have moved our students have moved on and so on so don't please don't be tempted to reduce produce an internal sheet to please offset because we don't want them we won't look at them and i hope that in itself eases the the workload and that work given to pupils matches aims and is coherent sequenced so these are the, the judgments are being used to see if your curriculum comes to life, which is why I've turned them into the questions that I, I talked about before. And the final thing is the impact, as I said right at the beginning, that they, we are including national tests and that we are next stage ready. So are your early year students, are they ready for key stage one and so on? When they leave primary school, are they ready for secondary? So within the curriculum itself, have you got them ready for the examination PE at the end of key stage three, if need be, but at, not at the expense of, of, of the actual curriculum coverage itself? And importantly, what it does say, if you're looking for a good inspection judgment, if the English department's doing well and the math department's doing well, but everything else has been sacrificed, you're not going to get a good outcome because work across the curriculum is of good quality. So this is the, the real emphasis on the importance of a range of subjects. So if you are designing and re-evaluating your own physical education curriculum, which is important because I think it's a good time, especially with September coming around, you might want to think, we've have, when was the last time we did this? If you're doing that, um, build on the questions from the deep dive. And, we, and, don't, and just to say that these slides are available afterwards as well. So that may be one of the questions, should have mentioned that before. There's a range of questions which I'm not going to go through. And I've picked some of them out from that, um, the document I showed you from AFP. But you could just ask those questions. It should be aligned to whole school intent, coherent sequences, scaffolded. You can see there's a range of things in there. But importantly to me is it should be easy to articulate and understood by key stakeholders, that one at the bottom. Key stakeholders include your students. Can they explain back to you as to why they're doing what they're doing? What about the rest of your team? 
Do they share the vision and how the curriculum is implemented? And a really important, can your senior leadership team tell you what is happening in physical education? And I think in some cases you're on a winner if they can explain the difference between PE, sport and physical activity and that posters, posters your clue. But not just to say, oh, we love sport at this school and we encourage it. Well, yeah, but how does that fit with PE? What we're we trying to do through to PE and can they give you some uh, understanding of what's happening at, say, Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4 and likewise in a primary setting? If you've, got, if you've got a good relationship with your SLT, you could maybe do a presentation for them to tell them what physical education is like in the school. If you're brave enough, you can say, like you would to your students, can you explain that back to me, please? But you'd have to have a good relationship there because I don't want uh, P45s coming in. Uh, but hopefully in a good school, that would be possible. So there is a key question in all this, though, because of the importance of SEND, is your curriculum inclusive? Absolutely vital question. And that's one of those things I would encourage at the department meeting to say, how do we know? Have we got to the bottom of this? So you shouldn't have to say yes, no, without thinking this through. You might need survey information. You might need to go and visit your own lessons and see who's taking part who's with who's just stood in the background either those students right in the middle of your group who potentially just just get on with things and they don't really achieve because but they don't cause you a problem you might need to dig a little bit in there and just a little note in here i've used a primary example just a reminder that an activity map is not a curriculum map okay that's important to know that it is not a curriculum map that is just a list of activity and that's where i said if you're using one of these snake type diagrams to express your curriculum then it would be about the learning but there's nothing wrong with this being in place to supplement it as well because that's about the timetable and often this is created because of space facilities staffing and so on so i get why these are there but we need to dig deeper if we're talking about a learning map so we're coming towards the conclusion now so if you're starting the planning and the rethinking process, I think it's the best way to put it, for your curriculum, this is a suggestion of what you might do as uh, some of the activities to help you to do that. So certainly, first off, it's working through that national curriculum document and then scrutinising how you fit into the whole school aims, mission, intent. What does your school do that's different to somebody else's and how can you contribute to it? If you're a school that has a real emphasis on leadership, well, you've got a great place to play. So you can see how your subject fits into the whole school in vital, because that's the next part is can contribute into the whole school, getting the SLT on board. Are there any subjects you could work with to share coverage? Like science, you know, when we do certain aspects, can you say, well, at that point, we could build that in and do a little bit of co-work with you in there? used to call it cross-curricular work perhaps in a sense but there are times when you could do that and you have to decide your endpoints and key markers of learning used in the national curriculum and now heads hearts and hand is in there as i said before that's the skill for the heads as the metaphor the hearts as the metaphor for the the thinking side uh, sorry the heads is the met metaphor for the thinking side the hearts is about the development of self and development of people skills and so on and the hands is the metaphor for the skill so there's at least three components to uh, good learning. Um, you've got to use that curriculum and create a curriculum overview which represents this learning journey, but not this activity map. Uh, but you must agree the overview with the key staff and particularly the staff within your team. And as I said before, can you present it? Can they present it back? Then you've got schemes and units that sit beneath it. So once you've got your big picture, then you can have your schemes and your units sitting beneath your overarching vision for your subject. And importantly, help the students, parents and other staff to understand your approach. Some parents in particular have had very poor experiences of PE and they don't get it. And they really do need to help to understand because if they've had a poor experience, they think that's what it's like as well. And they'll be the ones that may be encouraging their child not to take part. But hopefully we've, we move on through time and we get better at this. And so our students going through should have less and less negative experiences so they won't then uh, influence their own children in the same way. And that inclusive one's vital. And I just said there, as I mentioned earlier, if you're in the secondary phase, please, do you, do, you don't need to start GCSE in Key Stage 3. 
It's not essential. It's GCSEs and BTACs are written for two years, so you can perfectly cover them. But you can certainly plan, you can plan, do some work and develop a knowledge and understanding of health and fitness, for example, through some of the work you're doing in Key Stage 3, which will then get them ready for GCSE. So there's very clever ways around it without reducing it to something insignificant. And I do know one school um, where they started their GCSE and we work in year seven by having a theory lesson and then one practical lesson. So they lost half the time, even though only about 30% went on to do GCSE. So again, made no sense to me whatsoever keep it as practical as possible, keep the children moving. And there are a couple of posters that AFPI have produced. And again, I've, I've referred you to a couple before, and these are on the website. So um, the way they've been done is two, there's two parts. I'll just show the second part. Um, feel free to download these. And they're just some examples as if of things you may want to consider as you get your PE back to normal. So the, the ones on the inside that come up a bit more pinky to myself, they're the type of issues that you may be seeing. And then the purple side on the outside are some of the things that you can try to try and develop that aspect. And it's been developed into physical, emotional, um, and cognitive well-being and so on. So you can see on your, your diagram there. So they may help you. Uh, and just to say that AFPI, for those in a position, particularly if you've got the funding from the secondary teacher training program or you've got funding from the PE primary, AFPI has developed a qualification on website around physical and mental well-being. It's a level four qualification that you get accreditation for. And it would be an excellent idea for some of you to try and jump into that uh, because it asks you to, to take a whole school approach to develop a physical, emotional and mental well-being. So well worth looking on the website for that. And just to finish off, um, I know that some of you have been in school constantly and we keep hearing that, oh, well, you know, the teachers are back in. Some of you have not been off at all and most people haven't been off at all. You've just had to do things in a, a completely different way. You've had to uh, work harder than ever by uh, securing work for your students who are in and then doing homework here for their schools here and so on. So it's actually been harder. So to me, I would say I do raise a glass to you all. And uh, being a northerner, and this was this program was out around the same time as the royal family. So I'm going to leave you with a little challenge that I would say to the regiment, which is me raising a glass to you, and you would have a response, which I'm not going to give you. I'm going to encourage you to see what that response would be uh, if you were coming back to me. A simply a, a four or five word statement that you would do that. So as my little challenge to finish off for you. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Steve. Uh, really, really useful. I'm sure everyone, everyone's found it equally as useful. Um, we've had a few questions come in. I don't know if you can see the chat box. I can't. Um, at the moment. No, you might have to read them. That's through. fine. Yeah. So we've, we've had a couple around paperwork and evidence. Um, so one from James saying what paperwork would an inspector be looking for? Um, at primary level, and then from Neil, from an SEND perspective, what type of evidence could be asked for for practical PE lessons to show what pupils have done or can do? Yeah, um, I think the yeah, that's fine. So on, on the first part of the question, which is around around the evidence, is and I think I did touch upon it. The question may come on. There's absolutely no expectation of evidence, and typically when we come in. Uh, we would spend all our time visiting lessons and so on. And we wouldn't be asking for portfolios and pieces of evidence. You only collect evidence if you asked for by your school. Don't be doing it for Ofsted. So there'll be nothing where we'll be asking to say, can you give us the evidence? Because indeed, some of the evidence might then look like internal assessment information, which we're not allowed to look at. So you only collect if it's useful for you. And likewise, on the send, that's exactly the, exactly the same thing. I'm more happy to have a conversation around that. And if you want to have evidence to support something, that's fine. But there is no expectation whatsoever, and particularly when it's uh, in physical education, because the evidence might simply be in the lessons that we're watching. And we will go and talk to those send students and say, how does it, how is it working for you? Okay, brilliant. Um, Adam's just asked as well, is that the same for secondary schools, I would assume? To to totally. Yep. To totally. And, and, pl and please do not, I mean, this is a, a key message, do not collect um, evidence 
for the sake of Ofsted. If your school tell you to do something, that's fine. And I know some schools still misunderstand what Ofsted is about. It's, it's not a paper chasing exercise. It's only you collect information if it's useful to you, which is why I go back to that point about um, having too many data points. And we, we tend to use the term assessment information now rather than data, because assessment information might be words. It might be, you know, that's the most appropriate way of getting over telling people where they're at in physical education without numbers. We don't want to re recreate levels. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and, and just finally from Heidi, she's, she said, obviously, you referred to these snake maps a few times. Uh, she just asked, could you explain what they are or where she could find an example? Yeah, well, that's a really good point because we've not got many good snake maps for PE that I've seen yet, but you've probably seen them around uh, for other subjects. And I think even my daughter's school's got them. It might be, you'll see them for a geography curriculum. And it's almost like the letter S or a version of it, like a, a road map. Imagine the Wizard of Oz has been put down. And then what they're doing is just representing their curriculum in a big picture way. Um on the on the whole you know on the whole a one page diagram and then you that helps you to just say this is where we're at in terms of physical education and i haven't got any good examples because pe people haven't been creating this yet we've just been talking about it but you're probably more likely to see them for other subjects that consider themselves to be more academic shall we say but what it is is like a the best way to describe it is a, an s or a, just a, imagine it's like a road um, a snaky road and it's got key points coming off it and it explains the curriculum in that way so apologies i haven't got something to show you but it's just one example of a of a, of a way of doing it if you if you actually put if you want to into just go into the google you'll you'll see them what, what are they called someone's put there they're called story maps yep so you, if you go into google and just actually put those in you'll find a range but i'd love to see some good examples of pa so you'd be helping me out if i can see some as well Brilliant. And one final one's come in, Steve, um, just around how many data collection points do you think over the course of a year is enough? Uh, really interesting because the data collection points, as I say, more assessment information are they're often to do with what the school wants to do and the approach that um, that they do, they do for um, do your school does. But in the handbook, it talks about if you're having, I can't remember the exact word, so don't quote me, it's if you're having more than two or three they'll be asking questions as to why, as in, is it working and is it causing too much workload for, for, for no gain? And in PE, sometimes we don't need them. You know, that's the problem. You're, you're having to go back and to match up to that system when it doesn't necessarily work for you in PE. So that's a conversation to have with the school. But other than that, to say that Ofsted will not be expecting you to do it anyway. They just want you to know that you know where your students are at and that you want to know what your next steps would be. And however you record that information is up to you. And sometimes the problems that we have is a school says, I've got a Sims package and it asked me for a one to five. Can we do that? And that's quite frustrating for a PE teacher who doesn't want to use one to five. So if you do go down that route and end up with that, just try and find a way of making your useful information fit into their box, shall we say. Um, because I can't help you any further other than say that have the conversation with the school and say it doesn't really work for us but I know that's quite a difficult thing to do so I'm talking from quite an idealistic position so you will potentially just have to make it work for that system that they're asking you to use even though it does have some inherent, inherent weaknesses in it. Super. Thank, thanks very much, Steve. I think that's that's covered all of the questions. Right. Um, so I'd just like to say, sort of on behalf of everyone, thank thank you for, for your time and, and for that very insightful presentation. Um, and for everyone else, thank thank you again for, for joining us. As, as mentioned, we'll make sure that the, the slides get shared um, and any other useful resources. We've also recorded the session, so, so we'll get that up on our Sport Birmingham website. Um, in, the, in the next few days and make sure the link gets sent to you all. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good rest of the rest of the evening. Yeah, good you. Th thanks very much. And that's, uh, I'm really pleased that you managed to, to stay with it and keep up the great work. Lovely. Thank you. Take care.